Get ready for a game changer. Sarah Westall is bringing you Business Game Changers Radio. Sarah will bring you leading experts, visionaries, and newsmakers who provide the best commentary on big issues and cutting edge innovations. Sarah's 20 years as a business executive will help you think like an entrepreneur with expertise, energy, and attitude. Now, here's your host, Sarah Westall. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I hope you're having a great day today. It's Inauguration Day, and there are so many weird things that are going to be happening today and probably already happened. I have, I'm have i recording this the day before, so it'll be interesting tomorrow to really see what's going on. But this show, I'm bringing back Bradley Birkenfeld, and I just had him on today, and I'm going to have him on again on this show And what I really wanted to dive into with him is all the details he found out on the terrorist activities, what terror groups he had access to that he gave to the Justice Department and they didn't go after, and how the players behaved and why they hated him so much, and what he learned when he was in prison. Most of those people in prison with him were political prisoner so we learned a whole bunch of stuff there as well so we dive into all this and it's such a great thing to have on on inauguration day because it kind of shows you I think it really shows you what the backdrop of why so many people are so angry Brad Birkenfeld was a democrat and the democratic administration did this to him and so now he no longer is I don't think he really considers himself anything anymore because he, you know, you get disillusioned by everything when you when you get treated so poorly. You can't be so naive to think that any one administration couldn't do this. But this is the backdrop of what's going on. People just not doing things that are the right thing for this country and for people. We have so many great things in this country. We have so much technology and great things we can, prosperous things we can do. We could be the healthiest, most prosperous country in the world if we just put our mind to it, but we're so bogged down with this crap. It's really important. I know people don't want to hear it all the time, but it's really important for people to be educated on what's really going on behind the scenes so that we can make a difference and make a change. If you want to give up, go ahead. Give up and, you know, at least protect your family and try to have a happy, healthy life that way. But for those that are still in the fight and are forging on, it's really important to understand what's going on. I want to remind you, too, you can go to my website and at sarahwestall.com, and you can see a ton of different episodes there. I have over 100 different episodes and many, many articles on things. I go really in-depth on a, a lot of topics. I also just added a store, and I'm going to see how that goes. It's a little bit in experimental mode, but we need to fund this operation that we have going on. And right now, all I have is a mug up there. <laughs> But it's, it's a really neat mug. So it says, empower. Basically, remember, if you have somebody who's special in their life that's doing something that's difficult, it's a great morning remembrance that you need to empower yourself to get something accomplished or to just forge on. Remember that you have the ability to make a difference. Or maybe it's for you. You just need that morning reminder. But Every purchase helps the production of our show. So if you go there, purchase. I'm going to be adding other things as well. I have an ebook that I'm going to create. I have a bunch of different things, depending on how this goes. But hopefully, just go there and check everything out. And now I'm going to bring, and I don't want to take too much time because this is a long interview. We're going to bring back Bradley Birkenfeld. Hi, Brad. Welcome to the program. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me back on your program. I'm so glad you're back. I, you know, I read your book in detail this time. I've read, I read part of it and I, and I knew a lot about what was going on, but I had time to really get through your book and I, and I just kind of said, okay, I got to have them back. There are so many things that I didn't cover. And so I really want to dive into issues. And of course, there's things that are beyond your book that you have a lot of insight into that I would like to talk to as well talk about as well but for listeners who have not heard the first interview or might not be aware really of you and what you've done will you give an overview of what you ultimately did to swiss banking as a whistleblower 
Absolutely. Well, I think it's important for your audience to understand the complexity of what we're talking about here. We're not just talking a little bank in some little state or in some little um, city in the United States. This was the largest bank in the world, UBS, based out of Zurich, Switzerland. And I worked out of Geneva, Switzerland for the bank. And in essence, what I was doing was I was hired by the bank to be a head of business development for North America, for the United States and Canada. And in effect, what happened was we were managing money for people in Switzerland from the United States and Canada. Unfortunately, what the bank was doing was they were going so far to an extreme to acquire these assets, billions and billions of dollars, they were thumbing their nose at the laws of the United States and Canada. That means tax laws, securities laws, and broker laws, meaning you're not licensed to even ask people to invest their money because you have to be licensed, which makes sense. So anyways, I was working there and I finally came across some documents that were contradictory to what we were doing. And I challenged the bank to do something about it, the legal department, the compliance department, the executives, and nobody would answer me. So I decided to resign and then what I did was I brought it to the attention of the board of directors at the bank who called for an investigation and covered it up again. And then I had no other choice but as a whistleblower, a courageous whistleblower who exposed the largest and longest running tax fraud in U.S. history. Nothing comes close. I well, came the to board, the U.S. government. It's the secure. board of the bank knew about it, right? I mean, they all, it was very, it was so obvious, it's such a large part of their business. So everybody knew about it. They were just. They weren't going to do anything, of course. Well, well, this is it. It was a cash cow for them. And why would they even challenge it? Because in Switzerland, what they were doing was legal, just to give you an idea and your audience a clear picture. But the moment you step outside of Switzerland on behalf of the bank, almost like a diplomat, if you will, but you're, you're an officer of the bank, you're then into a gray area. And the bank didn't care because they knew it was attractive for the bankers to go from country to country, acquiring massive assets, investing those assets, making huge profits, clients weren't paying taxes, everybody wins except the masses get screwed and the tax authorities get screwed. So this was something so, so dangerous. But then on top of just tax evasion, which is pretty serious, you had all these other nefarious acts going on. You had drugs, guns, bribery, extortion, insider trading. And again, if you don't have transparency and accountability, all of these things go uncovered. You don't know what's going on. Clearly, with billions and billions and billions of dollars, there were many of these acts taking place on a weekly basis. Well, and I think that's the thing that really bothers me the most. And it should bother everybody pretty extent deeply when they understand that what they were hiding were, wasn't just tax evasion and everybody has their opinion on people dodging taxes but these were people who were laundering money for purposes of drugs and guns and terrorism and prostitution and and organ don't you know organ black market I mean all the bad stuff that you can think about they were allowing a vehicle for all this well, this is exactly right. And they were not only condoning it, but they were actually promoting it. And the other aspect of this is, and it doesn't really concern the United States so much, but it should concern them from a standpoint of a political standpoint and a humanitarian standpoint. The dictators around the world in third world countries were raping their countries dry. So they were taking these monies from African states and Asian states and so forth and bringing them to Switzerland and cheating their own people, people who are homeless and hungry. What kind of society do we live in if you condone that type of behavior? And that's where the U.S. government should have stepped in and said, we're not just concerned about the tax evasion and securities fraud and all of that stuff, but now we're going to go after these guys too. But they didn't do that. Well, they that's ignored a, it. It's, they did it's, nothing. It's appalling when you don't go after known criminals and you allow that to happen. I just... I don't know how any person could straight-faced allow somebody who traffics young children to go away free and not 
try to get them. I, I just, I don't, un, I can't fathom how the government could have that in their hands and they do nothing. Exactly. Well, this is where your audience must be outraged. And what they should do is they should write their senator and their congressman or woman and say, look, we want something done about this. We're tired of this big banks in bed with big government. This is wrong. We have to put an end to it. And if we want a better society, you better do something about it now. Because you can't just say, well, it's not my problem, because it festers and it grows. And, and unfortunately, what's going to happen here is you're going to get into a society where all of these things have been ingrained and they get deep roots and they continue. And it's very hard to uh, eradicate that if you allow it to continue in this fashion. Well, isn't it all tied to the World Bank and the Federal Reserve and how the whole banking structure is set up? Or can that be separated? I and mean, I don't even know. It's just kind of the way the whole banking system is set up. I would think they'd be able to separate out morality and say we are not going to, you know, banking is banking. It's money. But we don't, we're not going to help people be criminals. Well, see, the problem is this, is that, again, the Federal Reserve, in my opinion, they talk too much, number one. They should never hold press conferences. They should never be advertising what they're doing. That's not your job. Your job is to manage the fiscal uh, safety of the United States and the world economy. But instead, they act in secret. Then they give these press conferences and all these directors of the Federal Reserve. I, I honestly feel as though the whole thing has to be pride open and people have to say, no, you're not going to have this preferential treatment. No, you're not going to be able to just do what you want to do because behind the scenes, we don't know what's going on. And that's well, when people get screwed because. Well, they're not even being able to audit it. The one audit they did, they noticed that trillions was going overseas. I mean, we have no idea what's going on with this money. They could do anything. They could do, they're completely an open checkbook to do whatever they want with supposedly the country's money. I just, I don't understand. Well, it's a private organization and no member of Congress has, or Congress itself does not have the right to dictate what it does. Nobody does. Well, th this is where hopefully uh, the new president-elect uh, Donald Trump, whether you like Donald Trump or not, that's not the question. We have him as the next president. We have to support our president. You, you can disagree with them, and I understand some people don't like him, and some people do like him, and that's fine. But we have to get down to have the country run like a business. It's run for the last eight years under the Obama administration was a disaster, in my opinion. And I voted Democrat and Republican in my past, but I just feel as though we need someone in there to start changing the way we do things because everyone's gotten fat. Everyone's gotten lazy. Everyone's gotten said, oh, it's, this is the way we do things. We can't change. No, sorry. New sheriff in town. The American people want some change. And like I said, again, I'm not, I'm not here uh, cheerleading for Trump. I'm just saying that I feel as though for the last eight years, we have seen the country divided with immigration, with race, with economy. And everybody points the finger. Why don't we, rather than point the finger, come up with some solutions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's just get it done. Let's start working hard to get it done. Get I don't it. care. I don't care what you side of the aisle you're on. Let's we got some shared problems here. And they're big problems, Sarah. And I think your audience listening and, and friends of your audience will say, yeah, you know, we're tired. We work hard, maybe even two jobs. And people have to understand that we just don't need it as the status quo anymore. It didn't work. It got to understand. It's time to change. If something doesn't work, you better be part of the pro part of the solution, or otherwise you're part of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's you know what. Let's go more into some of these things that I, I you just you went through hell during this whole whistleblower thing that you did, and you had you had the IRS who was very um seemed to be very good to work with for you. They're the ones that paid the whistleblower award. And the Senate and the SEC, they all cooperated with your information. But you had this Justice Department who was just down your throat. And from day one, there was a character named Downing. 
at the DOJ that seemed to despise you. Why did he dislike you so much? Well, I think you're absolutely correct. What I did was, as a courageous whistleblower, and your audience can not only read my book, but check out my website, luciferstbanker.com, to see some of the documents and the articles and interviews there to support what I'm saying, because it's all documented, is the fact that the Department of Justice is a political arm of the government. It is not about justice, Sarah. It's about business. They're a business organization that t- claims to take credit for things that they did not do, or they did not uncover things that they should be blamed for. So the problem was the DOJ should have indicted so many people, but yet they all left the DOJ to go work in these big, fat law firms in Washington, defending the people they should have prosecuted. I mean, it's the biggest hypocrisy ever. Yeah, and they left we're They left for- the Downing, who despise you, <laughs> the whole time he was actually doing things to get the criminals actually off the hook. And then he left and actually worked for a law firm who is now representing those same criminals. I, it's amazing. Now you're saying that there's a whole group of people at the DOJ that, that are like that. Absolutely. And it's all documented in my book. Kevin Downing went to Miller and Chevalier. Um, Jeff Neiman, another assistant U.S. attorney in Florida, left and to go work for a law firm in Florida. I mean, it's, it's the most ridiculous hypocrisy you've ever seen. Organized crime can't hold a candle to these guys. These guys violated their oath to the U.S. Constitution, and they betrayed the American people. They should be indicted for felonies beyond crimes that we've ever even thought of, because we entrusted these people to do their job, and they did the opposite. So... The reason for the hostility by the DOJ is I made them look like fools because they never uncovered this. This is the largest tax fraud in U.S. history. Where were they? Where have they been for the last three decades, four decades? Yeah, but they knew it was there. They knew it was there. They purposely didn't want. Ah, so, so they knew that crime was going on and they didn't do anything about it. That makes it even worse. That makes you an accomplice. (laughs) <laughs> You're aiding and abetting a crime when you don't do anything about it. That's what the law says. If, especially as a law enforcement person, you see a crime that's going on and you do nothing. That makes you part of the crime. Well, don't you think it? Don't you think so, it has to be that? Because why would he? In your book, you talk about multiple characters who were criminals who are a higher level than you who were making things happen that they detained and then he helped them get off with nothing where he would but he was going after you full steam exactly because he didn't like the fact that i made him look like a fool they wouldn't give me um immunity they wouldn't give me a subpoena so i went to the u.s senate who welcomed me with open arms gave me a subpoena and i gave them the information they held hearings about this and the DOJ was called in to testify. So they looked like fools. And they didn't, they didn't do anything. They screwed up the whole case. So this is really the problem. And now this whole precedent they set has destroyed the fact that they could have put an end to this business overnight. But now they let them off the hook. Why? Because at the time, Eric Holder, when he was in private practice, defended UBS in private practice. Barack Obama, the president, was taking millions of dollars from this bank, UBS. At the same time, in the committee he never showed up for in the U.S. Senate, was investigating UBS for their crimes. I mean, this is, he should, he should be an impeached for this, actually, because that is actually financial treason. What the president committed was financial treason. And I, I will debate anyone at any time and anywhere in the world on that fact. And, the, and the, the issue is this, he betrayed, he violated his oath to the US Constitution and he betrayed the American people because what he did was take millions of dollars from a, a foreign bank for his own campaign when in fact they were under investigation. This is, how, uh, this how is did he take, I can't even begin to tell you. How did he take 
money from a foreign bank. They somehow laundered it through uh, uh, the a U.S. corporation. Or can you take money from a foreign bank through the political PACs now that they have? No, no. What they did was the chairman of UBS Americas, based in New York City, Robert Wolf, became a good golf buddy of the president. And he was raising money for the president. And they were the fifth largest bundler in America yeah. for the president. But that was UBS. So, yeah. wait a minute. You're playing golf with the chairman of the bank in America that is under criminal investigation by a Senate committee, the SEC, the DOJ, the IRS. Yeah, that's the terrible. The president is actually, I mean, it's, it, it's unconscionable. And, and your audience should be outraged. Just to read the part about President Obama taking millions from UBS at the same time he was not doing his job as a senator. He failed. So I got to ask you, there was more that went on with the Clinton Foundation and Hillary Clinton specifically that completely changed the fate of UBS in this case. What happened with Hillary Clinton? What well, this is another problem. Um, Hillary Clinton actually, as the Secretary of State, actually got involved in an international criminal investigation. She should have no right and no authority whatsoever to get her involved in that. That is the Justice Department and the IRS that should have been pursuing this. But instead, she got involved and had secret meetings with the Swiss. Well, of course she had secret meetings. Again, they settled the case for pennies on the dollar when they were violating our tax and securities laws for decades. And behind the scenes, we later find out that the Swiss government was giving money to the Clinton Foundation, that UBS was paying Bill Clinton to speak, to lecture, and they also gave money to Hillary Clinton. I mean, if that's not organized crime, I don't know what it is. Now, nobody has investigated it. You don't see anyone going after them and opening up a criminal investigation in which she had a conflict. She shouldn't have been taking money from the bank in which she settled the case quietly. And this is wrong. And your audience can go see this on my website under the UBS scandal. The documents are there. The information's there. And it's frightening. This was a global criminal organization, not just UBS, but the Obama administration, that's Obama, Holder, Clinton, were all a part of this. With with it's them being with them being out, is when Holder stepped out from the DOJ and, and a lot of these people went to different law firms, is it better or is it just another revolving door and it's the same behavior? Because it sounds like the other well, departments aren't as bad as the DOJ. The DOJ, J, from what I'm sounding, seeing, the Department of Justice seems like it's become such a political organization it actually is impeding our ability to do justice and really needs to go away. Well, they, they, they need greater oversight. And Senator Grassley, the chairman of Judiciary Committee from Iowa, who is a staunch supporter of whistleblowers and their rights, has really blazed the path and he should be commended because he's really the man that's pushed this forward to help people come forward and be protected. Now in his committee, his Senate committee, he should start holding hearings on the DOJ and I'd be delighted to come in and testify because it's important for people to know the truth. If you don't tell the truth, then what are we as a society? But more importantly, this DOJ has become, as you rightly point out, so politicized, and it's a business. What they do is they always try to brag and tell stories about how much money they got in fines and penalties. But what people don't realize is if you look at every single case, they settle for pennies on the dollar. That's well, yeah, and where does, and where do the fines, the where do the fines go? Who gets the fine money? Well, that's the other question. Well, you know, if you collect all these fines, how about we have a third party accounting of all the money that's collected? Where does it go? How does it get used? And does it go back to the American people that deserve the money? Geez, I haven't seen that money come back. Billions and billions of dollars in fines. Where do they go? We want an accounting. <laughs> yeah, where does we that money go? 
No, but just goes, yeah, sure. It goes down this black hole and we never see it again. That's wonderful. Sure. Americans get screwed again and they should be outraged. That's why I'm telling your audience, not just because I'm trying to promote my book, I'm just promoting the truth. I want people to understand that this is a global problem with the largest government in the world, with the largest bank in the world. They cheated each and every American, period. And again, if anyone wants to debate me on this issue, I'd be more than happy to debate them because I know the facts, I witnessed it, and I have the documents to prove it. Well, it's kind of like you were saying before we started the interview, we could go into business together and steal, go and rob banks, and we, we rob $10 million, and we get a hand slap, and we have to put give them back three. <laughs> you oh, know? And sure. And you the and three go, goes to the prosecutors. Sure, you and I go rob Bank of Minneapolis, and uh, you know we get caught a week later. And we say we're sorry, and we really didn't mean to do it, but we'll give you back six million, and uh, you and I keep two million each, and you know we'll find another bank to do it again. I mean, this is what's happening, and the problem with this scenario, and it, uh, and on a real serious note, this is the problem because the Department of Justice has set a awful precedent. Because it sends a message that we're not really going to go after you if you do this. Now, they'll go after the little guy and the individuals, but the corporations never get it. You indict a chairman of a bank, Jamie Dimon, put him in jail, I guarantee you, you're going to have problems. But you know what the problem is? These big banks, they all have secrets on the government. and Everybody's in bed with each other. And that's the problem. Yeah, of course. All in bed together. They all have the Hoover, right? The Hoover documents going yeah. on. That's it. And, and, and the American people should be outraged that they get screwed day after day. And not knowing it is even worse because behind the scenes things are going on that aren't helping them. Helping them to get a better job. Helping them to pay for their home. Helping them to educate their kids in college. That's what we should be talking about. Not about these big banks, Citibank, J.P. Morgan, and so on and so forth that screw the American people, and they get away with it. Well, you know, it's not business in general that get away with things, because there are a lot of business that get handed their butt <laughs> by the government. I mean, they go after them. And small businesses have no free ride, right? It's, it's not all businesses. It's certain businesses that are in bed with the government that are okay, but the uh, most businesses have to work hard and they have to be careful and they have to protect themselves because they are not immune from being taken down. Well, this is exactly right. But see, the other problem is this. Who has the most money to get some influence, buy influence in Washington? The bigger corporations. Sure, there's some companies that have been adversely affected and attacked by the DOJ. But the problem is, they don't put all this money in to buy favoritism. And that's the problem. Now, the other guys all hire ex-DOJ people to work in their compliance department or they work in their law firm or what have you. But this don't they the have problem. to? The isn't, that the, isn't that the problem is that they have to? To protect their business, they've gotten to a point where they have to do that. Well... Not have to, but how about but you know what I'm a, saying? How about complying with the? No, no, you're uh, right. It's it's a business decision. But how about first complying with the law so you don't have to go through all these? Hoops oh, agreed. Hundred percent. But don't you but think they nail people? Don't, don't they nail people regardless of you whether you're Republican? You can be a uh, angel citizen, angel citizen company, and you will get nailed. They'll figure something out to nail you if you're in the way of their political. Oh. That's what I'm talking about. That's the business Agenda. decision. Yeah. That's why you end up having to do all this crap, even if you're this angel company, because if you don't, you're going you're gonna to get... That's the problem with this kind of setup. Well, this is exactly right. And what happens is, you know, you, you play favorites. And you have favorites who can do this, that, and the other thing. But that's not the way the system should be working. It's not about favoritism. It's about justice, but justice is long gone. So now what we have is we have people who have to defend themselves because they put the force of the U.S. government behind it 
to indict people, to, to um, freeze their bank accounts, to accuse them of things. And even if they are proven wrong, the government, you've already done the damage. You've destroyed someone's career. You've destroyed their family. It's, it's outrageous. For whistleblowers. Yes, absolutely. Because they go after them. Because the whistleblower is the one who's actually exposing them for their incompetence and corruption. And, and we need more whistleblowers. We need people to come forward. That's where Senator Grassley from Iowa is the guy who has championed whistleblowing rights. This is something we must welcome and we must embrace. Well, what did they think? What did he think? What did he think when you were the only one that went to jail out of this whole debacle? You were the only one that went to prison. I mean, what did Senator Grassley think of that? Well, if you if your audience reads my book, you saw in some of the documents in the back, he wrote a letter to the Treasury Secretary and to the head of the IRS demanding answers of why Mr. Birkenfeld, me, came in, gave all this information to the government, and they did nothing. The letter yeah. is in my book. You can see it there. And he wrote this letter saying, that, this is outrageous. What, what are you doing? Yeah, so you, think, you were the more. only one that got nailed. That's terrible. At least you got an award. Think of the people who get nailed. They don't get an award. They just Their whole life is wrecked. They're in prison. Nobody else goes to jail but them. Well, this is exactly it. But remember, I came forward and started my whistleblowing before the whistleblowing law was even in place. I didn't even know about it. So I really came in doing the right thing. I didn't do it saying, oh, I'm going to get money if I do this. No, to the contrary. I came in doing the right thing. And now people begin to realize the timeline of the events that took place. And it's shocking because you're absolutely right. Most whistleblowers go to jail. Their family gets broken up. They're ridiculed. They'll never get a job again. This is outrageous. And that's where the whistleblowing laws have to be strengthened and people have to support it. Even Senator Johnson in Wisconsin, he supports whistleblowers. He is an advocate of whistleblowers and should be commended as well. And I think that's where America is starting to realize Senator Johnson, Senator Grassley, Senator Wyden, all of these senators have really supported whistleblowing rights because it's better for society. Exactly. Exactly. Well, there's some unfortunate stuff that you learned in prison, and I want to talk about it because it's very... It's in, it's very interesting. Some of the things that when you were in the federal penitentiary, whatever you called it, cupcake. What'd you call it? Camp cupcake. Camp cupcake. <laughs> Camp cupcake. But you learned a lot more than you thought. You there wasn't there was a time where you were making your there was what a weekend and you had to get a ride to your ultimate destination and you spent a a week or something in in solitary in second medium level and then you went down to low level after a week because that's just the procedure but you got a ride and you noticed that there were um a couple black people that had to walk it was like two miles down and and can you talk about that yeah it, what happened was i gave a press conference in front of the prison uh before i self-reported self-reporting means you self-report by your own admission you go there without any um, any law enforcement so i did that but at the same time before i reported i had about 30 reporters from all over the world out in front of the prison and i gave a press conference with my attorney wow the prison was furious they hated it because it put them on the map and it showed that, hey, this is wrong. This is not justice. This is about just some um, incompetent, corrupt prosecutors just trying to make a name for themselves and cover up for their stupidity. So they put me in something called solitary confinement for the weekend, just a couple of days. And I met a black gentleman in, the, in solitary for the two days I was there. And, uh, yeah, he was involved in a drug transactions with cocaine and so forth. And it just began to show how screwed up the system is about how these people are put away for decades for crimes. Now, I'm not trying to say that we're promoting drug use or anything like that. What I'm saying is that I think the way in which the courts and the justice system levies penalties and, and jail time is outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. And guess what? The American people are paying for it. 
This is union labor, prisons, prison salaries, all of these things, and they just and, and there's no oversight, none whatsoever. It's just part of their budget, and they keep spending and spending. So the whole situation was very eye-opening for me because I started realizing what was going on. I said, "This is this is absolutely outrageous. This is a fantasy land where there's no there's no rules in the sense that the, the guards they can do whatever the hell they want, and they did." They what do you mean? What the inmates? That, oh, geez. They would they would sneak in mobile phones to prisoners and sell them. They would get them uh, maybe um, 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 magazines that were restricted or drugs. I mean, I even saw a couple of guards who uh, had drug tests and got fired because they were doing drugs. I mean, but they got fired. To happen in a, well, uh, finally, <laughs> how long was it going on for? I mean, well, this is the problem, and this is this is it. So it it was really an eye opening experience. But you said that when in your book you were saying that you got a ride to your that meet that low level area, Camp Cupcake, but you saw other people that had to walk that two miles, and I was curious about that. Well, it, yeah, it wasn't well, it wasn't two miles, but it was a long way, and it was quite cold. It was in January. And I saw it, and I said it to the lady. I said, well, why don't we pick them up? So, no, no, they can walk. And, you know, I, I felt as though I said, wow, boy, what a real racist part of the country this is. And I, I understood as I spent more time looking around the premises over the next few months that it's a real corrupt racist system. And, for instance, the, 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 the prison would purchase snowblowers because it snowed a lot in Pennsylvania. And they had, oh, 20, 30 snowblowers, but they would make most of the black guys go out and shovel the snow. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what's the sense of spending the money on snowblowers if you're going to make these guys do manual labor in the middle of frigid weather? It was absolutely atrocious. And the warden should the warden should have been indicted. It was so it was really obvious of the difference in treatment. Oh. It was crystal clear. You could see it. And the problem was you had Hispanics, you had blacks, and you had whites. So that was really the mix. You didn't really have any other ethnicity there, such as Asians or someone like this. So you saw a real divide between those three groups of Caucasians, blacks, and Hispanics. And it was interesting to see the different uh, dynamic that was going on there. So it was really quite unfortunate to see the way in which central Pennsylvania dealt with these people. And you could see there was all kinds of favoritism played there. And it was, it was really quite sad, actually. Oh, that's not, that's too bad. And did the Hispanics have the same fate as the blacks? Well, it depends. Yeah, they got, they got mistreated. And I think you could see that there was favoritism being played, but yeah, there was, there was a lot of people who, you know, uh, did not benefit because, unfortunately, they just happened to be born Hispanic. And, and, you know, that wasn't their fault. That's just, that's their culture. So why why are you going to discriminate against them? So this is really, uh, it was a very bad scene. And, and to, it goes on to this day, Sarah. Oh, I'm you know, sure. Your yeah. audience doesn't see it, you know, because people say, oh, they're in jail. They should be in jail because they deserve it. No, not so. Most of these convictions are just absolutely wrong. They're fixed. They lie. They they fabricate evidence. The judges, most of them, have not even a clue. They just hand out prison sentences to people, and they don't really delve into the case like a, a really good judge would. So this is really a problem in America. It's a big problem, and it's costing the American people billions and billions of dollars, not just in costs of prisons and prison guards and, and all the supplies to keep them running, but then you break up families. And you you have them uh, just they can't uh, um, accommodate themselves. And then when they try to get back into society, they can't. Nobody will hire them. They can't get a job. And they're just put out the pasture. It's really quite sad. Yeah, because, you know, we talk really tough. And so we're thinking we're putting in these really hardened criminals. But that's not who's going to jail. I mean, those are going to, to prison and that we want to still happen. But we're we're creating a lot of criminal. We're like setting people. I, I had someone come and talk about. There's a lot of young kids that 
first offense, they want to go out with their big brother to be cool, and they're 15, 16 years old, never had a crime, not, you know, totally clean record. Next thing you know, they get a year in prison, and they're done. That's the whole, their whole life is now wrecked. Because once you get into that system, you learn the system, and you're done. And if you get in there when you're young, well, you can... go ahead. You're, 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 you're correct, sorry. And, and, and they're impressionable, these kids. And the problem is you get these prosecutors who are overzealous, who think they're tough guys, and they're going around trying to prosecute people. And again, enough with the press conferences. We don't need you to go out and be tooting your own horn at the taxpayer's expense, like you're such great guys. You have all this money to tap phones, indict people, get evidence. You're in bed with the judges, the probation, the police, and you're all like, yeah, we're going to fight crime. No, you're just there as a power trip. A lot of these guys are ego-driven idiots. And this is the problem. And they go after people for all the wrong reasons. Yes, there are some bad criminals there. Yes, we should be enforcing the law. Totally. But just take the UBS case for an example. Every one of my bosses above me was allowed a secret non-prosecution agreement. Why? Oh, that's right. They might start talking about Senator so-and-so or judge so-and-so, or billionaire so-and-so who had millions over in Switzerland. That's why they were all pushed back to Switzerland and not prosecuted. And that's what bugs me when Clinton was running for president, how she said they need to pay their fair share, and she was saying all that stuff. In the meanwhile, she was secretly, well, before, she was secretly making sure they didn't have to. So it... it that's right. <laughs> So come on. That's right. And she, she's, she's, again, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. She's certainly not part of the solution. She was the problem from the get-go. She and Barack Obama and Eric Holder facilitated, repeat, facilitated this tax fraud because they did not instill justice and they gave favoritism to these rich people who were hiding money in Switzerland. And yeah. at the same time, they were getting paid all these money. Hillary yeah. Clinton was being paid. Bill Clinton was being paid. Obama was getting millions for his campaign. Are, are you joking? That's the problem. Me? That's legacy? the problem I have is that they are getting paid to do all this. So that's bribery. And then the other thing I have is letting all the real, real, real bad guys go, and not taking that seriously. I mean, because that I don't I, like. Again, I don't have. It, it, it infuriates me that we had some real bad guys that we could have got that could have really helped a lot of people and they didn't even dive into it. It, it completely infuriates well, me. I'll give you, I'll give you an even better example. And if, and if for, for your audience who wants to read my book, I think they, they will be very uh, riveted to the story as you indicated, but certainly I um, um, gave them enough information to digest that will be very educational. And the very fact that I exposed one of the largest account holders who was doing illegal oil sales with Saddam Hussein is outrageous. And they did nothing. He had 400, over $400 million in secret numbered accounts and lived in a $50 million condo in New York City. Now, anybody in your audience who had a loved one who either got injured or killed in Iraq should absolutely be outrageous and demand that their senators investigate this. This is the most outrageous thing that has ever happened. And I think across the United States, how many kids, and I mean kids, 18, 19, 20, who risked their lives and went over to Iraq to fight for the country and came back in a, in a coffin. And yet I exposed a $400 million fraud who was doing illegal oil sales with Saddam Hussein, who lived in New York City. Are you joking? <laughs> really? <laughs> no. That's the stuff that makes me angry. Yeah. And, and it, that's the well, tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, that's one example of many. Well, that's exactly it. And that's why I'm saying your audience should be outraged and should get on the horn and speak to their Congress people and the senators. Go read the book. Go look at the documents I have in there on this guy, Abdul Aziz Abbas. You can see all of his numbered accounts, his secret passcodes, everything. I printed it in my book. Why? Because no publisher would, so I self-published it. I did it myself. 
That's the courage I had to explain to the American people and to the world that this is a fraud. The U.S. government was a fraud under Obama, and the Department of Justice is a fraud, and UBS is a fraud. Yeah, and we we just want to get our government back. We don't want to be a fraud. We want to be what we really can be, which is great. You know what Trump says, whether you like exactly. it or not, we want to be great again. And this is what he means, I think. You know, we don't want to be behind this. This isn't who we are. But, you know, one thing that, another thing that you were talking about is that a lot of the criminals in prison or a lot of people in prison were there on bogus petty drug crimes or there were political crim- or political prisoners like you. And you met other political prisoners and they shared their story with you and you learned a lot about some things. Can you share some of those experiences that you had? Certainly. There was there was a couple of people. One in particular was Bill Hillard, a very interesting gentleman. An older gentleman than me. At the time I was in my late forties when I was there and he was in his late sixties. And he used to wake up in the middle of the night screaming uh, because of what he saw as a Delta Force uh, individual in Vietnam. And he used to tell us how he used to guard shipments of uh, opium for the uh, the CIA. And uh, I was I was just astounded by what he was telling me. And he wrote a book, or actually someone wrote a book and mentioned him in the book. It was called Kiss the Boys Goodbye. This book is so riveting, it actually will give you goosebumps once you read the book. And what what he had witnessed was in the Golden Triangle, it's called Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, there was so much um, nefarious acts going on by our own government, not just the war. Forget the war. It was about guns and drugs, and they were moving things around and taking monies and breaking the law. They were not getting the prisoners of war out of Vietnam. No president ever did it. The problem was, the moment they got out, they would be telling the stories about how the CIA wasn't doing anything except lining their pockets with illegal drug sales. That's why no prisoner of war was ever released. Is it any, any surprise why all these presidents, all the way back to Nixon and Reagan, nothing happened? And When you read the book, and I was talking to Bill about it, and in the book, he's called Casino Man because he used to meet the uh, reporter in Vegas. And we went to, I read the book twice. I was just shocked by it. And you should really read this book, and your audience should read this book as well because it'll really put things in perspective and begin to tell you that the world is really, really corrupt. And we're getting tired of having the CIA dictate to us and saying they're doing so many great things. The CIA has screwed up more cases around the world than I can't even mention. Marcos, Saddam Hussein, Pinochet, Gaddafi. I mean, the list goes on and on. Well, but they seem like they're just as bad in a lot of ways because we we bring in really bad characters to take down really bad characters, and now we got just all bad characters. (laughs) You know, I mean, it just, it's... Well, you bring them to take them down, but we're part of the problem. Again, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. Now, I'm sure the CIA has done some great things. I'm not here to say that everyone at the CIA is bad. But the problem is, this is a monster organization with a monster budget. And don't you think we have better things to do about pollution in America, educating our kids in America, getting jobs for our kids when they come out of school? making sure our retired people are taken care of with medical care. Don't you think that would be a better thing than worrying about some dictator around the world? First, worry about ourselves, our own people. Then we'll worry about the rest of the world. Yeah, you can't dictate to others when you don't have your own house in order, I think. You know, there's a lot of... There's a lot of things that we need to do for self-defense, and I I can't argue that. I think it's you can't not because we have there's crazy people around the world and dictators that will do things that'll take away our way of life, and so you got to protect yourself. But come on, we don't need to be spending the money that we are. I think it's out of it's out of step with what we really need to do because we're not paying attention to our own people. 
And I, I just, I don't know. And maybe because the people who are in charge don't really see the United States as their base anymore because they're international type people because they have corporations all over the world. And so they're not really interested in the United States as much as maintaining their worldwide empires, you know. And so that's where the resources are going. And the citizens of the United States are just whatever. I, I, I don't, that's what it seems like to me. Well, it, it, you're, you're, you're dancing around the issue, which is a very good point here, is that what has really happened is rather than focusing on the problems we have at home, we always come up with a bad guy overseas. Because that way it deflects all the attention on domestic policy, and we look at foreign policy. Oh, Saddam Hussein's bad, Gaddafi's bad, Putin's bad. Sure, maybe these people are bad. I get it. I'm not saying that they're angels. But quite frankly... Don't you think it's better that we're really concerned that our kids eat a healthy diet, that our kids get educated well, that our roads and bridges and tunnels and so forth are made to top quality? So what happens here is we lose total focus and we're saying, oh, well, we have to defend the world. No, we don't have to defend the world. That's not our job. There's no mandate that says we have to defend the world. Yes, we can be interested. Yes, we can help our allies. Yes, we can do this. Even in your own state, what does it cost to educate and feed the kids in your state? Maybe two F-35 jets that cost $40 million a pop? Really? Couldn't use that money better, right? It's not, it yes, I agree. About. If you could divert a little of the priorities a bit and get our stuff in wet, we could, we could solve some of these problems. Like figure out why our food supply is is making us so sick. Let's fix some of that stuff. Get some scientists in there, real objective things, and understand what's real. Why do we have so many gluten sensitivities now? <laughs> you know, we didn't have that before. Why is there so many peanut well, allergies? We didn't, it's, it, we did not have that at the levels that we do now. I did a big report. This is all CDC numbers that allergies were almost non-existent back in the early 70s. Now they're off the charts. So what is going on? Well, exactly correct. It's, and again, this all comes back to society. What kind of society do we want? And you know, the only way it's going to be fixed, Sarah, and your people listening will, will resonate very well with them, is a whistleblower has to come forward and expose it. Because the people doing it will continue doing the bad thing. That's why the whistleblower protections are vital. And we have to enforce them. We have to make them stronger. And that's what exposes all these bad things. Well, did did you meet other people in prison, too, that you'd like to share here? I know you, you mentioned Joe Nacho, who was the um, CEO of Quest, one of the big telecommunication companies. And yeah, I met Joe, and he, he, was, he was an interesting guy. I liked Joe, a very intellectual man. And, you know, he, he like myself, pissed off the American, the U.S. government. So what they did was they trumped up charges against him, backdating options or something with his, his company. But really what it came down to, and again, it's in my book, as you know, is that what he did was said, no, I cannot give you, they demanded all the names of their clients. And he says, I can't do that. I need a subpoena. And this was after 9-11. And then he had been in the White House, and, you know, AT&T and Verizon, all these big telecom companies. They wanted to know all these addresses to find out possibly what was going on. But again, we live in a society of laws. You can't just demand something. And he was the CEO. He'd be liable if he had done that. That's against the law. You can't do it. So he refused, and they attacked him. Now, AT&T and Verizon capitulated and just gave him whatever they wanted, which, again, shows you how they're in bed with each other, big business with big government. Well, I had a now, really good friend. Want to catch bad guys. I had a friend who was Joe Nacio was, uh um, accountant or his finance, his money person. And he, he was a good, uh, I worked with him and he was under house arrest for about three years and he had died of a heart attack because he just couldn't handle the stress and they made him out to be a bad guy. And he, I don't think he was, he knew about any, if Joe Nacho was doing any really creepy stuff, I don't think this particular person was involved in that because he was more of a he was such a good guy, but maybe I have the wool over my eyes. But he 
he was so stressful for him and rocked his world to the point where this is not what he was about. And he ended up having a heart attack and died. He was 42. Well, see, this is exactly it. This is where the government, it's an, it's an overreach and they, and they get themselves involved in people's affairs where they're, um, they shouldn't be. And so many people's lives, they get divorced, they get blackballed, they die in this case, which is absolutely awful. And this is what happens. And a lot of people in the country are now beginning to say, you know, we're tired of this. And, you know, a lot of countries um, over the years, over the centuries, have resisted this and they've revolted. Now, I'm not saying Americans should, should revolt, but I'm saying that they should take a vested interest in their country and hold these people accountable. And the Department of Justice is at the top of the list for total change. Get these people under control. Stop all the illegal activities that they're doing. Stop being in bed with these big corporations and screwing the Americans who are actually paying your salary. And get it fixed. Because if you don't fix it, it gets worse. And it will get worse. It'll just be completely mob rule, which maybe we're already there. I don't know. I'm hoping. I really am hoping Trump can change things. I know people think that he has some major issues. And you know what? He probably does have some issues, but I'm just hoping he's a tough enough guy that he can go in there and just cut through the BS and change some of this. We need somebody like that who can, I mean, this is really rough stuff that they're dealing with. And we need somebody who's tough enough to be able to deal with this stuff and go in and just get it done. And I'm hope I'm really hoping he can. We'll see as he gets an office. Well, I agree. Yeah. I agree with you, Sarah. I think you're absolutely right on that point. And, and again, look, he, he's not the president for just a certain group of people. He's the president for all the people. Now, some people don't like him. I understand. But the problem is we have run amok for so long. We need someone to come in there and fix it and fix it fast. And, you know, it, it's like anything. You don't have to like someone to say, geez, I think they can get the job done. And that's what we're looking at now. We need somebody to get the job done. Yeah, we need we need somebody effective. There was a a journalist, they had this journalist panel and I was listening to it and they had people from a whole cross section of different people and and uh, you know, people who liked them and people who didn't. But there was this journalist that was kind of in the middle. He understood both sides, but he understood but his comment at the end was you know, we the time of having somebody like Obama who was very uh, polished and a great speaker, but not that effective is over. We have someone like Trump who probably isn't very polished. He's not that great of a speaker, but I think he's going to be more effective. And I, I'm hoping he's right because that's what we need. Somebody, I would love to have someone who can speak well and, and be effective at the same time. But uh, what we need most is somebody who's effective. And I'm really hoping really hoping with everything that I've seen over the last few years, interviewing people and talking to people, we need somebody that can make a difference. Not just him. It's much deeper than him. He can only be a certain, you know, that he can help it. We need a lot of people to work with them. We need people, we need leaders on every level of society to get in there and say, okay, enough is enough. But we need effective people all over the place is the bottom line. And I'm hoping he's one of them. Well, this is this is right, and I think everybody wants to see a better society, but I think someone like him, who's a little bit rough around the edges, which I like, I think people need a wake-up call. Americans have to understand. You have to get off your ass, you know, work harder, get involved, and try and do something. And again, it's easy to say it, but it's much more powerful to do it. And I think this is what we're beginning to see, and in Europe it's happened a lot, because now I live in Europe, and you see a lot of these politicians getting pushed out in Germany, in France, in Italy, in England. And I think with what Donald Trump wants to do is he really he really believes in the country. And I think he takes a vested interest as a businessman. And as we all know, business people are really out in front because they get good information. And they try to do good things. Sure, they're trying to make money. A businessman or a businesswoman doesn't try to lose money. <laughs> I mean, well, but they're the ones like that. I think. They're the ones leading our country. Let's face it. They're, they're the ones, entrepreneurs and business leaders, nonprofit leaders, they're business leaders too. 
they're the ones leading and getting yep. things done in our country. And it, you can say you absolutely despise a business person. It doesn't make much sense because they're the ones providing jobs and getting things done in society. We just hope that what they do is positive for our communities and not negative. Well, this is exactly right. You, you, again, this is what we need. We need the people with the, the, the highly educated people, the successful people, to bring those smarts to the government. The government has never run business well. Every time we've seen government get involved in a the business, they've screwed it up. The military screwed up from an economic standpoint. Uh, Health care is screwed up from an economic standpoint, and so on and so forth. So now it's time to change. You had your chance. Exactly. Now we're going to go this way. <laughs> exactly. Let's, we don't have a choice. We either get it done or we... We don't have a choice. No, we don't have a choice. Okay, Bradley, how do people get your book? Well, you can go onto my website. You can order it online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can order the Kindle, the iTunes. It's all there, Ebook or the hardback. It's uh, available. The website, luciferspanker.com, is uh, up and running. Uh, there's a lot of great information. I'd be happy to come out there and hopefully lecture out in your great state. And, yeah, I uh, want you to. Maybe we get together and do this again. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get back together maybe. again. Well, it's, it's important because, look, I'm here to try and educate the people in America to understand what I went through and what's going on behind the scenes. Because remember, a whistleblower doesn't have to lie. They're there telling the truth. So that's why nobody wants to listen to the whistleblower because they're either going to get caught up in the illegal acts or they're going to get exposed. Well, it's, a, it's ugly. So <laughs> it's ugly. It's very ugly. And that's and that's why I was very courageous, again, to expose the largest and longest-running tax fraud in U.S. history. Nothing comes close. One guy exposes billions and billions and billions of dollars. It's incredible. And, and, and maybe, hopefully, maybe Donald Trump will give me a pardon because I think I deserve a pardon. That's incredible. I wouldn't hold your breath on that, but that would be really great if he did. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, you know. It was <laughs> It would be great would, if he did. It, would send a me- it sure would send, it would send a, message. a message. It would send a message saying we want yeah. more whistleblowers coming forward. If he did that, that would be that would be wonderful saying I support whistleblowers, I support cleaning this up and he was the only one that went to prison. That's ridiculous. And and what was his motto? His motto was make America great again. Do you realize Nobody in U.S. history has ever done more for the United States than Brad Birkenfeld. I brought in $15 billion to the United States and counting. Well, I think you could have, I think, I think if they would have cooperated, you could have done a lot more. I mean, if they, they would have used that information to um, get some of these bad guys, if they would have got the guy who was doing the illegal oil sales to Saddam Hussein and things like that, I think there could have been a little more that you could have done. <laughs> now, I, I think what you did do was amazing, I, uh, but <laughs> that's where my anger comes from. It is was because, more to be done. Because, you know why? Is because all they did, and this is what you document too, they nail the, the people who they got the tax money from were the people who weren't as powerful. They nailed all the, they, there was other people they could have got tax money from that were connected and things. Those people got off. It was the, they nailed the people who didn't have any political pow- power or didn't have that much influence. There wasn't that big of a deal. And everybody else got off. And that's BS. And for your audience, just another point, just to, to nail this point home, is that I gave them another client who was lived in Boston who was the biological brother of Osama bin Laden, the most notorious terrorist in U.S. history, this was his brother. Now, I didn't say his brother was a terrorist, but you think you might want to start with family members on a big 9-11 attack and think about all the families in 9-11 who were adversely affected with injured people or their loved ones got murdered. But where, and wasn't I Osama bin Laden, didn't Osama bin Laden's family get flown out of the United States when after all the flights were yeah. down? So, <laughs> yeah. That's correct. And I gave... And I gave the Department of Justice a 
his biological brother, Abdallah bin Laden, who lived in Boston, who had a $14 million account at UBS in Geneva. Yeah, well, it makes Why would you, you pursue that? Well, it makes you wonder, because there's more behind that 9-11. No, than... it, doesn't make you, it doesn't make you wonder. It makes you furious. And I'll tell you, <laughs> exactly. And <anyone> <laughs> listening has had, had someone, a loved one, who was injured or even passed away or was murdered as a result of this, get on the phone with your center and demand a Senate hearing on this UBS case. Demand it. Yeah. I, I the agree. only way to get justice. Well, and then the senators have to have the courage to do it, right? Because there's a lot of senators that are afraid as well. And they're probably being blackmailed and threatened behind the scenes. And so people, it takes courageous people to, to make a difference in this world. And yeah, it just does. And so they, they, we need to give them the people who step up and are courageous. We need to give them the support. And that's what I did. Yeah, exactly. You did. Exactly. Well, I, I thank you so much. And I, you're in Italy relaxing and having a great time, which I'm jealous because I'm sitting in Minneapolis with, I think it was what, eight below this morning. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, oh my God. <laughs> it's a cold, well, we're in the coldest <laughs> month of the year too. So we're, you know, I'm jealous, but anyways, th thank you so much for coming on. And I am definitely going to keep in contact with you and we'll have you on again. And hopefully I can have you up to speak to my class and other classes. I'm teaching, like I told you, an ethics, ethics and corporate responsibility at the University of Minnesota. So I think it would be a good topic to explore. Well, I would love to do it, Sarah. I'd like to help other people understand what's going on. And uh, at free of charge, of course, I'd love to just come and just, you know, help out. And uh, hopefully people will uh, read my book and look at my website, luciferspanker.com, and uh, we'll be in close touch. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Sarah. You as well, and God bless your audience. Oh, I am apologizing right now that I cannot play this entire interview. I am sorry. We're out of time. And first, I want to apologize that there was a little delay throughout this uh, interview because he was in Italy and we had a little bit of a delayed uh, reception while we were recording. But I thought it came over still pretty well. And you, other than the delay between me and him talking, I think it's fine. But go to my website later and the full interview will be up there in podcast form and it'll be up on YouTube if you want to listen to the remainder of the interview. But for now, I hope everybody has a wonderful day and stay safe. You've been listening to Business Game Changers with host Sarah Westall. Tune in each Monday at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, as Sarah brings you leading experts, visionaries, and newsmakers who provide the best commentary on big issues and cutting-edge innovations. Sarah's 20 years as a business executive will help you think like an entrepreneur with expertise, energy, and attitude. Tune in Mondays at 12 noon Pacific time, and learn more about Sarah at sarahwestall.com today.